when are recess lights allowed in an attic? And maybe this means in the attic floor. You mean to light up the attic or to? <laughs> I believe this would be upper level of the home ceiling light fixtures that penetrate the ceiling into the attic floor. And why there's a picture of knob and tube next to it, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure that one out. Um, well, certainly, you know, they can be used in, in bathrooms and shower ceilings if they're damp location rated, if it's the proper one. So, you know, pretty much all the time. Closets, it depends upon the clearance to the shelf. You know, just follow the the um, illustration that's in the code checkbook. It tells you the, the, the prohibited box area where they're not where any light fixture is not allowed. Well, actually, it depends upon the type of fixture, but uh, there's a good illustration in the in the code checkbook. I, I have a relevant question. Why are can lights being used at all? We have wafer LED lights. Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, new nowadays, yeah. Some people like incandescent. <laughs> Good luck finding one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, are we still commenting or? Yeah, no, I think, I think what the question may have been referring to is the type of cans and IC rated, non IC rated and insulation coverage is, is what I think this question is about. Um, so if that's where you were going, go for it. If not, go in a different yeah, direction. Just, just for the guys out there in, the, in their own markets is uh, just to be aware, lots of times, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, you, you had non-IC rated cans that were being shoved up into ceilings. Um, and probably it's going to be more effective on ranch houses and the second floor of two-story homes that actually took the insulation and pushed it right up against some flooring in the attic too, which had the paper right on the can. So if you see those types of situations, you know, if if we're not going to go to the more modern type of LEDs that are out there, at least recommend put LED bulbs in so that the temperature comes down. We all know that as the um, the longer you're in contact or paper, any materials in contact, the lower the ignition temperatures with some of these like par 30 lights that generate you know 250 degrees. Um, and that's what you, you know, just something that you'd want to avoid or I, I look for if I'm into those older houses. I think along those lines, it's, it's definitely important to be looking for, you know, that, that age of house. And when somebody's come in and put in, you know, a dozen recessed lights, and you can tell that originally this house didn't have these, they're probably remodel kits installed from below. They're probably not IC rated. And if you can, you want to get up and take a look at that. The main reason I know this is at one point I had several inspectors and one of them did not identify the 83 remodel kits that went into the ceiling directly into the insulation buried in there. And the homeowner um, was not happy when the electrician came in, or actually we had recommended more insulation. The insulation contractor came and said, we're not touching any of this until you replace all these light fixtures because we can't bury these under insulation. I went back to the property to look at it and you pull down the stairs and you walk up and like there's three lights just sticking out right there. Yeah, well, one thing also, of... one thing that I learned with uh, recess light fixtures that I do, and it was kind of accidentally I learned this, but when I'm inspecting a house with a bunch of can lights, I turn them all on and I leave them on during the inspection. And when they start turning off and on by themselves, you know you got a problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, that means the thermal thing is working. Well, yeah, so we tested that. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> well, and if you uh, turn them all on before you go into the attic and you see light every place, they're not IC rated. Right. Probably not. Mm -hmm. What are the different types of circuit wires and what are their characteristics? I mean, I think some of this is basic. Uh, I have had the opportunity to see some knob and tube actually still in service, still with voltage running through it. And, you know, as long as nothing's touching it, it's okay, but it should probably get replaced. Cloth sheets. So what's this like from the twenties, thirties, maybe. Then we get into some armored cable, metallic sheets, BX, MC, AC, UV, NM. What do all these letters mean, Jim? 
BX is uh, armored cable. What's AC? Armored cable. Hmm. The BX is a cable system. It comes with the wires in it. It's a brand say, name. Say that again, Mike. It's a brand name. Yeah, BX is a brand name. It's a cable system. Brand name. It comes okay. with the wires in it. Wires so in it. BX is like Romex. Uh, it's called no. MC now. No, I'm just saying like I NM. Thought, oh, I end up like, calling NM Romex all the time, yeah. even though it's really MC NM. is metallic con metallic conduit, right? BX and MC are virtually the same. Mm -hmm. It's like Mike oh. said. It comes. Metal clap. Mm -hmm. It's metallic the flexible shape. metallic conduit that comes with the wire inside of it. UV mm -hmm. is the UF UV exterior okay. underground. Yep. And M is non-metallic. Mm -hmm. Otherwise known as Romex. My so understanding is that the MC <laughs> is uh, is the new BX of today. It's the new AC. It's the new armored cable, and it has the ground in it. Whereas the old armored cable, the old BX was a brand name for AC, which was the armored cable, which had you know you were allowed to use the outside sheath as your you know as bonding uh, your uh, grounding conductor. You know your equipment grounding conductor, and that that did have a bond wire in it that was not supposed to go into the panel. Yeah, it was it yeah. was something different. It wasn't a, it wasn't an actual bonding conduct. It wasn't an actual uh, equipment grounding the strip. Conductor. It was a bonding strip. Right, it was a bonding strip. Mm -hmm. So is it just bonding like the 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 outlet boxes and the and the armored cable together? Or? What is, what is that wire intended for? It, it maintains the continuity of the of the outer uh, sheath because exactly. um, a lot of times it pulls apart. So it's to help maintain Got the it. continuity for the equipment, uh, well, for the bonding and equipment ground. Just going to interject for a moment. Uh, when you see the <clears throat> BX cables, guys, in uh, <clears throat> in attics, uh, going to attic fans, it's where you'll find it in the more modern house. It's just a four or five inch coming off the thermostat of the fan. Take a look to make sure that that hasn't disconnected and the fan wires are not exposed because when that fan starts to vibrate, it's going to cut the wires and it's time to get rid of that fan uh, or rewire it or you know go to the ridge vent. But I often see that out there. It's something you catch at the last minute as you're about to go down the, the ladder again. And technically with BXMC AC cable, you're supposed to use an anti-short, which is a little plastic piece that slides into the end before you put that, the cable clamp, the, right. the armor clamp. Anti-short bushing or redhead. Exactly. Yeah. And half the time they're not there. And I'm not hand. pulling the box cover to look. We also had a picture of the knob and tube and, uh, and joining or extending a circuit with the, the uh, right here. And um, as you can see, in a lot of your knob and tube installations, if you're in the basements of the houses built in the 20s to the 50s and you're looking up and you're seeing the tapping off of your uh, knob and tube for a new circuit, you're finding them taped. And sometimes they used to put a little tin weld or tin solder on it but the taping is not an adequate solution compared to what this is. Um, that is, you know, you, you want the full junction box. You don't want tape in the mid run. Um, and of course you don't want the snob and tube to ever be damaged where one leg is disconnected. Sorry. There's your redhead, red hat. Red hat. <clears throat> so here's what we were talking about. So the, the image on the top is AC cable with that, that little strand of wire. And then the bottom one is MC with the ground wire built into it. So a three wire, two, three, or two wire, I should say. I'm still waiting on you, Hollis. This image actually goes with a question. It's funny, now I see what's happened. All the slides have moved. Uh, so are receptacles allowed above electric baseboard heaters? What's the code say? 
I just got this new book. <laughs> Actually, the code doesn't address it, but the manufacturers no. <laughs> of the heaters say they can't be above there. No. So are we ready? Right. To... Yeah, there, well, there can be receptacles in the baseboard heater. They're part of a listed assembly. Like yes, in the, on the right side of the picture. The image there. Oh, I'm not seeing it. Oh, that's because he switched it over. You're seeing the... Uh... Seeing I'm seeing a big Internet of Things, a big yeah, Internet, Internet, of Internet of Things. Internet of Things. All right, well, this is where Mark Goodman comes in to talk about smart homes. So you started out about the evolution of, you know, standards of practice and whether they're low voltage, high voltage, or will we need to inspect them? Um, I can tell you um, that as part of the new RDS for the um, National Home Inspectors exam, they did address it. Not and I'm not specifically going to say what they addressed. Um, I can tell you we're going through a major SOP update for ASHI, and they will be addressed. Now, whether you have to inspect it or not have to inspect it will be spelled out. But really, smart homes used to be low voltage, with the exception of the very high end systems. But everything you by now, the internet of things, everything that's connected, light switches are hardwired. They're 120 volts. They're smart light switches. They're smart outlets. It's not just the light bulb anymore. It's the light fixture. It's the ceiling fan. Every, so last year I went to, I joined the association for smart homes and I went to their conference. Because if I'm teaching the class, I need to stay up on what the cutting edge is. Every single thing you can find in your house is now the smart technology is built into it. But in reality, we're not going to be able to test most of those aspects. You're not going to have an app. You're going to be able to test the mechanical portion of it, but you're not going to have an app or a control panel or a password to test a lot of the functionality of it. In fact, you may look at something and not even know if it's a smart device or not. Um, Lutron, not Lutron, Leviton had the Decora style paddle switches, light switches, and it used to say smart on it. They stopped putting smart on it because the consumers didn't like it. So now it just looks like a regular switch. So unless you know what to look for or how it reacts, you're not gonna be able to determine if that's a smart switch. So probably what I would say is you need a really good disclaimer <laughs> to say that you're not gonna be able to test certain types of functions of them and you're not going to be, may not be able to determine if it's a smart device or if it's not a smart device. And if the sellers take the brains of the system, so let's say there's lots of different ways of running these systems. If you're using an Amazon Alexa or Google Voice as the brains of the system, well, your Amazon account's tied to that, right? Are you gonna leave that behind? No. Nope. And when you take the brains, all of the automation is gone. So if you don't have a list of what type of devices, what communication protocols, if it requires a password, um, it, where it's at, how are you going to know? You're not going to know. So the best thing is to have a good, ex, a good disclaimer. And also recommend they ask the right questions. Recommend that they ask for a list of all smart devices in the house. Smart homes are really, the devices are about connected devices, but it's really about the automation. And so if you have um, somebody who's marketing a house as a smart home and they take that Amazon, 
Alexa with them, is it still a smart home? Or is it's it a zombie? <laughs> it's a zombie. Exactly. Is it a dumb home <laughs> with connected devices? That's real. So, you know, so what you see now is, you know, if you have a smart switch, almost all of the smart switches require a neutral wire in order to be able to provide those services. Okay. It's not just breaking the hot connection anymore. So a basic switch is just a normal light switch is just breaking the connection. And it might be breaking the connection and the neutral may be in the ceiling by the light fixture, or it might be in that box. But if it's not in that box, if you've got, if they're just breaking the connection, you're not going to be able to put a smart switch in there unless it's one that doesn't require a neutral, which greatly limits the capacity. But there are lots of wireless switches. So Lutron makes something called the Cassetta, which has a Pico remote, which looks just like the switch. So if you have a staircase and there's only a light switch at the bottom of the stairs, you can now take that remote, stick it to a piece of Velcro on the wall at the top of the steps, put a plate around it, and it looks like the light switch, but it's battery operated. Is that a replaceable battery or? It's a replaceable battery. So if you've got a switch that's not working, it might be a dead battery. It may not be that they didn't wire the three-way circuit correctly. Now with the cassettes and the Leviton, you were talking about the, the decor, like the rocker style switch. So your regular rocker is gonna have like the full range of motion. Are these the ones that, that don't do that full rock where they, they almost have like a spring or a kickback to them? Some of them are like a mo momentary switch. Some have the full range, but you know, if you flip a switch and you hear a mechanical click like a relay, it's probably a smart switch because our switches nowadays, you know, you don't really hear much of anything when you flip a switch. It's not like the old days when there was actually, you know, mechan mechanical connections and you could hear the springs and stuff, you know, kind of like the mercury switches, you know, there was no... There was no feeling to it. It was just a slide. So if you hear a click, it's probably a smart switch. If um, there's a delay in the lights coming on, it's probably a smart switch. And it's probably because it's communicating with something else. So if it's using, requires a hub like Lutron does, you can use the Lutron standalone, but if it requires the hub so that you can connect it to your app, then there's going to be a delay because it's talking to this and then it's talking to this and then it's going back before it turns the lights on. Or if it's a mesh system like Z-Wave or Z Z Zigbee, they have a relatively short band length. So that switch by Hollis might be talking to the switch a little bit further away to this device, to this device, to this device before it gets to the hub and goes back and turns the lights on. So if there's a delay, it's probably a smart switch. If it's got a little blue light or a little emblem on it, it might be. There's a lot of crazy looking switches out there. If it looks pretty unique, something really different out there, it's probably smart, but you really don't know. If you're looking at an outlet and you see, um, a, you know, a uh, on off button, or just one button that you can press. So it's not, it's just a single button. It's not um, a GFI with two buttons. It's a smart switch. And that, that on off bu single button is turning on the bottom half of the switch. So the bottom half of the switch is smart. The top half is live all, all the time. Kind of like when you used to walk into a bedroom and they'd have the bottom half of the switch hot by flipping the switch on and off and the top half was hot all the time. And all they were doing was breaking off the tab connectors between the two screws on the sides. <laughs> so um, what you see now, there's smart panels, okay? But um, what you're seeing there is with the little white loops in it and the orange block, that's not smart 
That's not a smart breaker box. That is an energy management system. And so question for Mike here is the box UL rating says you're only supposed to put things in that are rated to go in that box. Okay, those energy management systems, the man energy management company says it's rated to go into any electrical panel, but it's technically not rated to go into whatever brand box that is. What, what would you say about that, Mike? I would recommend inquiry as to whether it's listed to be installed in that box. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not going to take it out and look at it and play with yeah, it. Yeah, I mean... If normally, when we see something in a box that doesn't look like it belongs there, we might call it out. But in this case, you know, I would probably tell somebody that it's there, but I probably wouldn't make a big deal out of it. But yeah. now there are other panels. So that breaker you see in the center um, and the white panel, the white panel is the Leviton smart breaker box. Those are actually smart breakers. Mm -hmm. So it's about energy management. It's about energy monitoring. And you can turn a circuit breaker on or off remotely. But if it trips, you still have to go to the panel box and reset it. They don't want somebody to keep hitting their app and turning it back on. And the one in the center, um, those are actually control modules. Um, they're smart devices, but um, they're control modules that get installed in a panel box. Uh, the thing on the smart breakers is with the exception of two brands, there might be a third one now, all of your 120 breakers take two spaces and your 240 mm -hmm. breakers take three spaces. So if you're putting smart breakers in, in a traditional panel, it's going to take a lot more space. So you may, may need a bigger panel box. Well, wouldn't that, well, that box brings up a, Yeah, wouldn't that's that a good point. Yeah, sometimes I look for, you know, if that box is looking like it's more than 80% full, you got too much stuff in there. I've seen where they've got those those circuit monitors installed, you know, on many uh, branch circuits, and it's just too much stuff in the panel. So you don't want to get more than about eighty percent full because you're, you're you're exceeding the box fill. Exactly. That's what I was going to mention was box fill on the panel on the right with all the white stuff in it. Uh, yeah, it reduces the amount of empty airspace that yeah. you're supposed to have in the panel box which directly impacts the UL rating. Mm -hmm. um, but anything in the house, so plumbing fixtures, faucets, uh, Kohler as a shower system, will that cost about three to four thousand uh, dollars? That's smart. You know, so you can create an automation so it knows when you walk into the bathroom, a sensor knows it's you. Um, it knows that you like to watch it, listen to certain news. So it comes on in your smart mirror. It knows that you like to take a shower at 102 degrees. So it turns that shower on at that temperature. When the humidity level gets high enough, the fan comes on, you know, you walk out of the bathroom and when the humidity level drops, the fan goes off. You can, the sky's the limit in what you can do in automation and it used to be very complicated, but now it's very simple. The fan is probably the best one. Walk in, okay, here's, here. what's your dream automation? No, it's the one that, the fan is nice. That's a good thing because it does help with controlling humidity. The one that scares you is the toilet that flips up and when you get near it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there, <laughs> have you ever used one of those? I was I I had the opportunity to use one once and I'm I can't wait to get one. Uh, I'm not going to spend three or four thousand dollars on a toilet. Well, that's the thing. You know. But you know, one of those toilets actually analyzes the human waste to tell you if you have a health concern. <laughs> that, for that is a real thing. You walk in <laughs> your bathroom, you know, in the middle of the night, the light comes on to ten percent, so you're not blinded. Yeah. Uh, the one I like the best is you know, is your kids get up and open the window and your teenage daughter gets up and opens the window, you know, late at night and the Amazon Alexa says, what are you doing? Close the window, go back to bed and you get a notification on your, <laughs> your phone. 
No more sneaking out like Mike did when he was a kid. Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> or, or probably I should have used Larry Ciro as an oh, example. Nice. <laughs> With his guitar to serenade the girl? Is that the, girl? the sky's the limit? There you go. So now we're back to our regularly scheduled slideshow. Uh, please explain this thing about separating grounds and neutral in distribution panel. I'm going to say, Mike Casey, you can handle this one. I, I can, yes. Um, well, basically, once you leave the uh, the main disconnect panel, once you have a, a box with a main disconnect, everything after that, the neutrals in the equipment grounds should never touch each other. Because what you'll do is you're going to set up a parallel path for return current. Now, you know, a lot of people will tell you, well, there's no current on the on the neutral. And that's just not true. You know, there's a reason that it's insulated. So <laughs> there is, you know, whatever current goes out on the hot should be coming back on that neutral. And if it doesn't, you have a ground fault, which means you're leaking electricity somewhere. So what you don't want to set up which happens all the time, if we connect grounds and neutrals together, like in a distribution panel, like at a, a clothes dryer, <clears throat> where we use the neutral for uh, an equipment ground and some of these older three, you know, three wire cords, you're setting up a condition where now return neutral current will take all available paths. Of course, the amount of current that will travel on each path varies depending upon the impedance or the resistance according to, um, you know, different electrical theory, but you set up a whole bunch of paths going back. So you can induce that current into the um, equipment, into the chassis, into conduits, into plumbing piping. And, you know, what can current cause if you have a loose connection? Cause heat. So it could cause a fire. It could hurt someone if there's a, a little bit of voltage behind it, maybe because you have a a leak that's not enough to trip a breaker. So it can be a significant hazard, basically, without going further belaboring it. Um, it's a it's a hazardous condition. So Mike, why is it allowed in a main panel, but not the sub panel? Everything connects together in the main panel because the return current, once it leaves the transformer, always wants to go back home to mama. And that's the transformer. So we just force it through the house. And when we get back to the main panel, it knows which way to go. It knows to go up to the or out to the transformer. So connecting everything together is what you want to do because current wants to go back to the transformer. And if there we're leaking current, you want to provide it a place to go so it trips a breaker if there's a malfunction. I think it's important here, and, and I'm sure you guys would agree that like when we talk about the main panel. Some people, homeowners, inspectors are going to say, oh, the main panel is, you know, the first panel in the basement, but that may not be the service equipment. And right. so it's important to know where the service equipment is, because that's where everything gets tied back together. So oftentimes you might have, you know, the, the panel is remotely located in the basement. It's not near an exterior wall. Now you have to have a service disconnect at the meter. Now that first panel board is not the main disconnect. It's not the main panel. Even if it has a 200 amp disconnect, it should be wired as a subservient panel. <laughs> I like that. Well, sometimes, <laughs> you know, sometimes your main disconnect is out at a pedestal somewhere. On some of these remote properties, you know, it might not even be at the house. So, you know, inside the house, everything's a sub panel. That would be, that's true for a, a lot of manufactured homes. That pedestal is the main disconnect. Everything inside the, the manufactured home is a sub or distribution panel. In St. Louis, we're seeing a lot of the combo meter bases now where that meter base is your main panel and it may just have a disconnect or mm -hmm. you may actually be able to put breakers into it. Right. So it's a meter base and a panel board combined. All built into one. It's combo, yeah. What are we going for here, Alice? Are... I've got I've got a couple questions uh, from the. All right, Larry, go ahead. Okay, um, one of them is: um, Do smart switches have to be protected against lightning or other surges? Um, no, they do not. It's just like wiring everything else. But um, 
you know, Mike can tell you the code here, but now whole house search suppression is uh, type one or type two is required. Um, is that 2022 or 2020? Um, 2020, I think. I, I don't know. Jim, do you remember? Or was that before? I, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, it's currently um, so, uh, surge or lightning protection, surge protection is required in all si new single family, but it depends upon when you're, uh, when the property was plan checked and when it's going to be adopted. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was the 2020 NEC. I, I, we're Actually, still might, you know what? It was the 2017. I remember now. <laughs> it was, it was prior to that. So it's been right. a while. But search of protection is really recommended in every house if you want to protect your yeah. devices. And on search suppression, um, they say you should use a cascading system. You want type one, type two, and type three. So you still need the search strips, even if you do have whole house search suppression. What is reverse polarity and why does it matter? How do you explain it to your clients? Kevin? So the, the way I explain to the client is um, as, as, as simple as possible. If in a properly wired polarized receptacle, you plug in a table lamp and the, wire is and the power is gonna run up to the switch, which you have control of, you're gonna turn it on, turn it off. And that breaks the circuit coming back on the neutral. In a reverse polarity, your power is actually running up the neutral and you turn the switch, you're actually breaking the circuit. So the power goes out, but you feel like wow, the power is out, so it's safe to touch. So in a reverse polarity, actually be, be touching your brass base can actually give you a shock because the power is there even though the light bulb's off and you're completely unaware. That's a simplistic mode that, that my, my clients tend to understand that you know the power is not running the way you think it should be. The fan doesn't spin backwards? In a motor yeah. arm. Motor? <laughs> Hollis, these slides got all messed up. <laughs> How do you test GFCIs and AFCIs? Do you test them? What do you say about them in your report? What recommendations do you, what recommendations do you make for adding these devices? Jim? Uh, I test GFIs by pushing the button. Then I plug my tester in and see if it'll trip on external trip. AFCIs, I will only test in new construction or vacant homes. Uh, you never push that button in an occupied house because granny's upstairs with her iron lung running or something, you know, and you're going to cut that off and she's going to croak on you. Um, how do I report? Uh, well, when you push the button and smoke comes out, that's easy. You put the video in the report. <laughs> show them what happened uh so if they don't trip you just report that it needs to be replaced what recommendations do i make as far as installing where they aren't i just say you need to install them unfinished basement areas garages exterior wet locations yeah i recommend as an upgrade in older homes you know, it's not like a 1917 house. It wouldn't have been required, but I strongly, I recommend, you know, strongly that they consider upgrading for optimal safety with uh, GFCIs in particular. Well, I guess in a lot of old houses, you could uh, suggest that they install AFCI just because you got old shaky wiring in them. Well, usually I'm replacing, <laughs> recommending replacing the wiring anyway. Oh, so that, well. Yeah, how often does that happen? Uh, never, but I told them so. <laughs> uh, this is my question. What, what is it with multi-branch wiring that causes arc faults not to work? Does that make sense? You've got a, like a, you know, a three wire going out, two hots and a neutral, servicing two different pieces of equipment and you try and put an arc fault on it, there's something about like shared neutrals. Help me with the shared they, neutrals and arc faults. I've heard electricians complain about it. They make an arc fault that's got, two, that's got two levers on it. 
if you're sharing wire. Yeah, but you know, multi-wire branch circuits, uh, today's arc fault circuit interrupters are, are prepared for that. It doesn't affect them. It says right so in the instructions. So I don't know who's telling you that. I had a client that, that had a renovation done and uh, they had to put in arc faults everywhere. And then you're, they said, you're losing your mic. Oh, there's not a microphone. Check, check. There we go. Yeah. Uh, they had to put in arc faults oh, everywhere, but the arc faults kept tripping, uh, just nuisance tripping. And the explanation was because of shared neutrals. Mm, I, I, I don't think so. I think something was wrong. All right. Because, yeah, the, the arc fault circuit interrupters, you know, they're made for uh, multi-wire branch circuits, which is, you know, two 120 volts share in a neutral. And, you know, possibly what they did was the circuits in ballast. They may have, you know, improperly wired them. <clears throat> But you know, it says right in the instructions that they're they have capacity that they're uh, compatible. Excuse me with with uh, multi wire branch circuits. So I, I don't know. It's a unique situation there. The the image in this slide is for the next question, which is how big a deal is aluminum wiring really? So we've got some aluminum wire there, and then we've got some some ways to repair it. We can't and see the image online. So it's a big deal if your house burns, <laughs> really. Well, why would your house burn? I I think most of the fires that we've had in Dale City, which has a lot of aluminum wiring south of us here in Virginia, uh, were caused by people adding or tapping into those circuits with copper and making an improper connection. That's my personal thought, is that these homeowners were doing things they should not have been doing. That said, um, I checked a receptacle at a friend's house in Dale City, pulled it out of the wall, and that receptacle had been replaced with a receptacle. It was marked CU, and that thing was burned up right there at the, the screw. So you have to be careful when you have aluminum wiring and make sure that everything that you're hooking up to it is marked to AL. What about copper clad aluminum? Does just that have like, the same issue? Just like copper. Yeah. Yeah. And just to go back on the aluminum, to add a little bit more to what Jim said, um, you know, if you're talking old technology, solid aluminum conductor, like that type is, you know, probably it looks almost looks like Kaiser brand. Um, I can't really tell, but if it's old technology from the 60s and 70s, it uh, should never be connected to anything that's CU only. It should be, like Jim was saying, you know, CUAL or the newer, more, more modern type is a CUALR receptacle. But that would include switches and everything else. So I recommend an electrician, you know, check the entire house and all the connections because of the potential fire hazard. I, I had a house once with with this aluminum wire and came home from an inspection one day and it smelled like fish. And I was sitting there like, what is that smell? <laughs> I went in the dining room and touched the, you know, finally after about 10 minutes, put the back of my hand up against the receptacle covers and I found one that was hot and sure enough, pulled the cover off and I was getting, you know, the neutral conductor insulation was black because the connection had come loose and was creating heat. So. It can be a big deal, you know, and we're required to, to report it, I think, still. And is it, Mike, there's something about the difference in aluminum alloys before a certain right. year. 76? Yep. Is it 76? Um, I, I don't remember when they changed the alloys. The modern stuff that we're seeing, you know, certainly multi-strand is fine. Um, you, there's some modern uh, solid strand aluminum now that we're seeing, and that's fine. But it's the stuff from the 60s and 70s. Uh, maybe 76 was, uh, you know, a banner year for aluminum. I just don't remember right now. Our next question is, what are breaker locks for and how do they look? Excuse me, how do they work? Uh, and there's an image that goes before this. I think this was a three-part series where one's in one position, one's in the other position. Um, why do you need these? What do they do? 
Why are they important? I'll go to Mike again. Oh, me? Okay. I was sleeping. Um, yep. <laughs> so the basically it's a disconnect for a, an appliance that is not within sight. So instead of having that appliance disconnect, let's say a condensing unit outside for air conditioning. If it's not within 50 feet and visible at all times from the appliance, you're required to do, you know, you got to do something else. And that would be a lockout type uh, disconnect. So basically you could turn it off and take your lock and put your lock through the hole in that brass thing. And nobody's going to be able to turn on the breaker that's going to screw with you out working on the unit. So that's just a lockable disconnect is all. And sometimes, go ahead. I was just going to say, so it's a safety issue for the service tech. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you use wire nuts inside a main panel? I'm, I'm wondering if this question is, can you use the panel as a junction box? Yes. Who are you asking? Yes, you I'm can use. At you, but... you can use a panel as a junction box if you have an old small panel, sixty amp or whatever, and you're taking the breakers out of that or the fuses out of it. You can use it as a junction box. Uh, let me rephrase that. Um, not in the service equipment. In a panel board downstream, there is a hot wire that comes into that panel and leaves that panel without going through an overcurrent protection device because it's overcurrent protection devices back over there somewhere. Yeah. Can you use the panel as a junction box in that regard? As far as I know, no. I'd say no. 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 So obviously, to... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, no, it it either has it has to, you know, either terminate or or originate from that panel. So, you know, if you want to use a, a wire nut, I don't know why you would run a, a conductor or several. You, first of all, if you're running a single conductor, it's supposed to be ganged with the other ones. So, you know, if it's just going through a panel and wire nutted together, that's certainly um, objectionable. There's something wrong with that. And I'm sure it's against code. I'm sure I could find something. So you're saying if you have an old 30 amp panel on the ceiling of an old row house, but you have a newer panel somewhere and the newer panel feeds the old panel, but then feeds the fixtures. You can't do that. No. So you're talking about a panel that's completely, um, all the, the fuses are stripped out of it and it's just being used as a junction box. Right. Yeah. I think that would be fine. Yeah. I think the question has to do with where your, your piece of Romex is too short to really get everywhere you want it to get to. And they've spliced maybe the uh, black lead to get to the bottom breaker or something weird like that, you know? Is, is, do you find that objectionable? Oh yeah, where they've changed out a panel and they've got, the they've had to extend the wires in the, in the new panel. Right. They use wire nuts or now they probably yeah. use wire nuts. That's fine with me. How about you, Jim? Yeah, I don't have a problem yeah. with it. How do you report no receptacle in a bathroom? You say there's no receptacle in the bathroom. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's how you report it. <laughs> exactly. And and if you want to put one in, it should probably have a ground fault on it. Yes, it should have a ground fault. It should, not probably. Easy question. Next. Yeah. What is that white chalky substance inside a panel? Something the electrician did. You don't want to know. <laughs> no, I think you, I think you're talking that. about. <laughs> I think you're talking about it, the breaker, and that's the sealant between the the plastic halves when they glue it together, and it dries up sometimes and it falls out. You talk about the white powder that kind of ends up on the on the um, breakers. I, I think See, that's the nice what thing. We're talking. The nice thing about being the moderator is I did not write these questions, and so I don't really understand them <laughs> either. Well, yeah, uh, I've seen we, this. It so. could be the overspray when they're spraying. Over the that's what I was going to say. That's what we were talking about yesterday is when the, the painter came through and the panel board cover wasn't on it and the whole thing got coated in white. So yeah, you can well, clear, up something. You, you can clear up something here <laughs> while we're talking about overspray and panels. How much? Zero. None. None. Yeah. Right. Any contamination, panels out. Good luck. 
<laughs> what do you tell the what do you tell the buyer? This panel board needs to be replaced. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. There you go. How big of a nick in copper wire can there be before you consider it a defect? This might go to the same principle. You can't nick it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, you can nick it. You're to. not supposed to. Yeah, anything more than basically a scratch is is technically incorrect. How much <laughs> exposed copper is allowed inside a service panel? And then similarly, how much insulation on the Romex can come in through the connectors and be in the panel? So exposed copper on a ground is fine. All of it, it comes that be, way. All of it can be exposed. Yeah, but the, your... how, what about the hot neutral conductor? Hot neutral. You're going to have a little bit exposed at the break. Right. Yeah, I see what, a little what, bit. What is it like a sixteenth, an eighth? I think it's an eighth, Jim. Is that a, is that Prob a real number? Probably an eighth or no more. I, what's the real number? Somebody that, grab a code. That sounds check. like right. a scientific wild ass guess. Yeah, it's not in the code, I don't think, but it's an eighth. I I actually looked this one up and I found it's that, very it's a very small amount. Did yeah, there was a three standard eighths, three eighths was, half an inch, an inch, two yeah, way too much. There was some kind of standard I found that was an eighth of an inch. So how about the, the insulation the around it? Wire uh, jacket, quarter inch. Yes. You're saying quarter inch in the panel. Yes. So you shouldn't see like a whole line coming no, down. No, you can straight. maybe see if they write on it, so they know what, what's, what circuit it is. But coming where it comes to your uh, strain relief, your wire connector, quarter inch. Pretty sure that's right, Mike. Yeah, well, you know, I don't see that. They usually come through with eight inches or so and there's a big long label on it. And I don't get excited about it. As long as you're not exceeding about an 80% fill, I'm, I'm okay with it. Do you remove junction box covers? Jim does. For his buddy. Yeah. <laughs> I think it kind no. of depends, but as a general rule, no. This is not with this slide, but it's, I think, an example of a bootleg ground. And so on the bottom there, you can see ground wire coming off of there and, or not a ground wire, but a wire that's connected to the ground, I think, is that what that's showing? Coming off the neutral. Yeah. Oh, is that a bootleg ground, Jim? I can't see yep. it. Looks like, yep. They're all screwed up. So they're talking about removing the outlet cover, which is a junction box cover. You know, we're not required to, but sometimes I do because I'm curious. If you suspect there's like if you're getting weird readings or something seems different or. Yeah. Or yeah. Or I suspect a bootleg ground, like in a distribution panel, it's two wire and M, you know, cable. And then I've got three, three slot receptacles showing up as grounded. Like, yeah. If something's wrong. Do you do the same thing if there's aluminum wire? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I try to not let anybody see me. Hollis, <laughs> 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 yeah. oh, so that might be the best way to go is if you do it from there, because these ones are all out of sequence. Do you check heat in the panel? I don't. I don't know. I don't I, know. I, 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 see, I see a lot of reports where inspectors, of course, have a picture in their report of their infrared camera pointed at the panel. Well, we don't know if it's under load, you know, what circuits are under load. That's what Well, makes you know, it's a pretty picture for the buyer. It makes them look like they did <laughs> something, you know, because other than that, the report's probably almost worthless. Well, so, in the, in the so. image here, the inspector noted that one leg was room temperature, we'll call it, and the other leg was significantly warmer by 50 mm -hmm. degrees. And he called it out and the electrician came to look at it and he couldn't recreate the issue. Hmm. Big mystery. Well, the electrician also has the insulated tools to check the torque on the main lugs. Apparently he did that and they were both tight. Yeah. So, but I, I pretty much can guarantee you that if you have electrical overheating and the lugs aren't covered with safety caps, the one that's overheating is going to be discolored. Yeah. 
Yeah. It will the left one slack. looks a little bit discolored. The left one kind of looks a little different. So, but anyway, the electrician checked it. What are you going to do? You know? That's it. Next slide. Do you inspect photovoltaic voltaic systems? PV I, for short. Solar panels? PV. Uh, I mean, I do. I get up on the roof, make sure they're attached properly, make sure there's no issues with the roofing material. I try and figure out what sort of system it is, whether it's got mini inverters or a big inverter, and mainly try and find out like who put it in and include that information in the report so at least they have some sense of what they're getting into. But I don't really make any comments about if it's working or how well it works. All the ones I've seen uh, have the installer's information on the panel outside. Yep. What's the uh, I think that's required. SOP say? No. And that's what I would do. So that's the yeah, I recommend that I recommend that they have it checked by an expert and also find out if it's leased or owned. But other than that, unless there's you know a, a panel sliding off the roof or something that's clearly obvious, um, you know, I'm not inspecting them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, you, you should find out what, what, or the client should find out whether it's lease or owned. And they also treat it like swimming pools uh, in a disclaimer that says uh, that it was not evaluated. Check with installer for any updated service advisories or safety issues since the time of installation, because things may, came out, may come out after I leave. And that just sort of a, is a legacy that says, hey, this could change. So that takes us to the end of electrical. Uh, we have question. one more session. Do we have a question? question. Can, you just, can you explain um, why neutral wire cannot share the lug on the bus board? Oh, uh, because of, I, I guess I'll answer that one. It's, you're talking about the terminal bar in a, um, like a distribution or a main panel. It's one neutral per slot. Uh, number one Correct. reason is that's what code says. Um, the reality of it is because it's difficult to get equal torque. Remember, the neutral is a current carrying conductor. And to get equal torque, especially if they're two different sizes, in the same round slot is difficult. So it could end up with overheating. So it's one per for, for neutral. Now, the grounding conductor, you could have two. The same size. Yes. The same wire size. Correct. Yes, sir. And I believe in the new uh, non-metallic cable, they're going back to the smaller ground again. Oh, a size smaller? Yeah. 